Today on this channel, let's explain different underworlds include their kings. The mythological underworlds are interconnected through multiple gates positioned along the borderlands of hell and earth. These portals lead to various underworlds, including Yamaloka, the Hindu equivalent of hell, Hades, the Greek underworld, and Yomi, the Japanese underworld. Each gate is intricately designed to reflect the aesthetic and thematic elements of the respective mythology it represents. For instance, the gates of Yomi are adorned with artistic Shinto decorations. Entities residing within the underworld are commonly regarded as thonic beings. The concept of an underworld is pervasive across civilizations and speculated to be as ancient as humanity itself. Recurring themes in underworld myths include narratives of living individuals embarking on journeys to the underworld, often driven by heroic motivations. Additionally, many myths emphasize the necessity of proper ceremonial observance for souls to gain entry into the underworld. For instance, the ancient Greek legend of Patroclus haunting Achilles until proper burial rites were performed exemplifies this tradition. Furthermore, Individuals of social stature were traditionally attired and equipped to facilitate their navigation within the underworld's realms. Now let the video begin. In Slavic mythology, the afterlife is depicted as a dynamic realm inhabited by various entities, including deities, spirits, and departed souls. Central to this cosmology is Nav, the underworld governed by Veles, a deity embodying both earthly and otherworldly attributes. Understanding Nav and Veles requires an examination of Slavic mythology, deeply rooted in ancient Indo-European heritage and interwoven with regional customs across Eastern Europe. Veles, associated with fertility, wealth, and livestock protection, assumes a prominent role as the deity guiding souls through the realms of death and rebirth. Nav is depicted as an expansive and enigmatic realm, often portrayed as a concealed underground kingdom. Its landscape is characterized by darkness, faintly illuminated by phosphorescent fungi and ghostly fires. Black rivers meander through the land, ferrying departed souls to their ultimate destination. Nav's boundaries are fluid, with portals scattered across the mortal world serving as gateways to the underworld. The underworld teems with a diverse array of beings, ranging from ancestral spirits to formidable demons. Veles reigns supreme as Nav's ruler, his authority extending over both the living and the dead. Lesser deities and guardians oversee various domains, ensuring order and equilibrium within the underworld. Departed souls traverse Nav's dark corridors, their fate determined by their earthly deeds and divine judgment. Slavic communities have developed an array of rituals and ceremonies honoring the deceased and placating Nav's spirits. These practices, though varying across regions, share common themes of ancestor veneration, purification, and communion with the otherworldly. Offerings of food, drink, and valuables are presented to Veles and other deities, seeking their benevolence and safeguarding for the living and deceased alike. Nav features prominently in Slavic folklore, serving as the backdrop for numerous myths and legends. These narratives offer insights into the underworld's inner workings and its interaction with the mortal realm. Veles emerges as a central figure, depicted alternately as a protective guardian and a cunning trickster. Themes of death, rebirth, and cyclic existence permeate these stories, reflecting Slavic spiritual beliefs and cultural values. Despite centuries of Christianization and cultural assimilation, Remnants of Slavic mythology persist in Eastern European folklore, traditions, and language. Veles, in particular, continues to captivate the collective imagination, inspiring artistic, literary, and musical endeavors across generations. A resurgence of interest in Slavic mythology in recent years reflects a yearning to reconnect with ancestral heritage and delve into the depths of the human psyche. Helheim Helheim constitutes one of the nine worlds and stands as the realm of the dead, presided over by the deity Hel. Positioned beneath the roots of Yggdrasil, the cosmic tree, Helheim emerges as a realm steeped in mystery and intricacy, assuming a pivotal role in Norse cosmology and eschatology. The genesis of Helheim stems from the ancient Norse myths, 
transmitted through oral tradition before being transcribed in texts like the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda. The designation, Hell, often connotes hidden or concealed, epitomizing the veiled and enigmatic nature of the underworld it epitomizes. In Norse mythology, Hell emerges as the offspring of the trickster deity Loki and the giantess Angerboa. She is depicted as embodying both life and death, with one aspect exuding vitality and beauty while the other languishes in decay. Bestowed dominion over the underworld by Odin, the chief of the gods, Hel assumes rulership over this realm. Helheim is depicted as a frigid and somber domain, characterized by dim forests, icy expanses, and veils of mist. Nestled beneath one of Yggdrasil's roots, it serves as a nexus between the nine realms of Norse cosmology. Guarding the entrance to Helheim is the formidable Hound Garm, whose eerie howls herald the approach of departed souls. Upon traversing into the realm, the deceased encounter Hel herself, who adjudicates their fate based on their actions in life. Helheim harbors a plethora of inhabitants, comprising both living and deceased entities. Foremost among these denizens are the souls of the departed, who dwell within Hell's Hall, known as Ljener. These souls endure a twilight existence, devoid of the splendor reserved for denizens of Valhalla or Folkvanger. In addition to the departed souls, Helheim accommodates an array of other entities, including the giantess Hela, who assumes the mantle of Hell's sentinel and enforcer. The realm is also rumored to house an assortment of monsters and spirits, contributing to its eerie ambience. Helheim occupies a central position within Norse cosmology, constituting one of the nine realms that constitute the Norse cosmos. It maintains intimate ties with Ragnarok, the apocalyptic event in Norse mythology prophesying the cataclysmic clash between order and chaos. During Ragnarok, denizens of Helheim are slated to rise, joining the climactic confrontation between the divine pantheon and their adversaries. Hel herself is destined to lead an army of the departed against the forces of Asgard, culminating in the denouement of the Norse mythological cycle. Helheim has captivated the imaginations of writers, artists, and scholars across epochs. Its enigmatic allure has served as a wellspring of inspiration for myriad literary and artistic works, spanning from medieval Icelandic sagas to contemporary novels and poetry. Moreover, Helheim's influence extends into popular culture, manifesting in diverse mediums such as film, television, video games, and music. Its dark and mystifying essence permeates various genres, continuing to enthrall and entice audiences worldwide. Du, Du, the Chinese underworld, represents a realm steeped in enigma and fascination. Embedded within Chinese mythology, religion, and culture, Diu serves as the posthumous destination for souls subjected to judgment following death. At its apex resides Yanluowang, the mythical sovereign who presides over the domain of the deceased, administering justice and retribution commensurate with the deeds committed during their earthly existence. Understanding Diu necessitates an exploration of its historical and cultural underpinnings. The concept of an underworld in Chinese spiritual systems traces back millennia, originating from ancient religious rites and philosophical tenets. Ancestor veneration and beliefs concerning the afterlife were foundational to early Chinese cosmology, shaping perceptions of mortality and the soul's journey beyond corporeal confines. Evolving over epochs, these beliefs underwent refinement influenced by philosophical currents like Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, each contributing to the intricate mosaic of Chinese metaphysics. At the heart of Diu's lore stands Yanluowang, the paramount ruler presiding over the netherworld. Portrayed as an austere and commanding figure, Yanluowang epitomizes justice and sovereignty, tasked with overseeing departed souls as they confront judgment for their terrestrial actions. Legend depicts him as an imposing sovereign endowed with the authority to dispense punishment or bestow redemption based on the moral fiber of the departed. Yanluowang's domain spans a vast and intricate expanse, partitioned into myriad levels, each governed by distinct codes and statutes. Diu is envisaged as a labyrinthine subterranean realm, comprising multifarious realms, chambers, 
and passages, each serving a distinct function in the soul's voyage. Mirroring the hierarchical stratification of Chinese society, Diyu's structure delineates tiers corresponding to the severity of sanction or spiritual ascension. The abyssal depths harbor the most infernal precincts, reserved for the gravest transgressors, while loftier spheres offer prospects of absolution and eventual rebirth. A noteworthy facet of Diyu is its framework of rewards and punishments, reflecting the moral ethos and ethical precepts of Chinese society. Souls confront various torments or reprieves commensurate with their conduct in life, with acts of filial piety, benevolence, and moral rectitude garnering merit and potential salvation. Conversely, transgressions such as avarice, deceit, and treachery elicit retribution and anguish, as souls endure the repercussions of their misdeeds within Diyu's fiery depths. Traversing Diyu entails a perilous odyssey fraught with trials and tribulations, as souls navigate the perilous terrain of the underworld in pursuit of redemption or absolution. Guided by celestial emissaries or divine entities, the journey unfolds in consonance with the karmic debt accrued by the departed, with each obstacle presenting an opportunity for spiritual enlightenment or moral atonement. From the torments of condemned infernos to the serenity of virtuous paradises, the soul's pilgrimage through DU engenders a transformative experience that shapes its trajectory within the cycle of reincarnation. While steeped in ancient mythology and tradition, Diyu exerts a profound influence on contemporary Chinese culture and societal mores. Its iconography and symbolism permeate myriad facets of daily life, spanning religious observances, funerary customs, artistic expressions, and entertainment. Moreover, the concept of Diyu serves as a moral lodestar reminding individuals of the repercussions of their actions and the imperative of leading a virtuous existence consonant with traditional values and ethical norms. Bulu. Bulu, the Fijian underworld. Governed by the enigmatic deity Rachimabulu, Bulu stands as a domain inhabited by spirits, demons, and otherworldly entities. Rooted in the rich tapestry of Fijian mythology, Bulu finds its origins in oral tradition where stories of gods, heroes, and the afterlife intertwine. Central to this mythology is Rachimabulu, the revered deity who reigns over Balu with unwavering authority. Depictions of Rachimabulu vary, yet common portrayals depict him as a formidable figure, blending human and rat-like features, wielding authority over the spirits that dwell within his realm. Ancient Fijian legends recount the genesis of Bulu as a distinct realm separate from the world of the living, where souls embark on a perilous journey after death, confronting judgment and the prospect of eternal repose. The passage to Bulu is fraught with dangers, with souls navigating treacherous waters and encountering malevolent spirits. Yet, for those deemed worthy, Bulu offers the promise of reunion with ancestors and the prospect of basking in Rachimabulu's divine presence. Though ethereal in nature, Balu is often envisioned as a tangible realm boasting distinctive geography and landmarks. According to mythological accounts, Bulu sprawls as an underworld, enfolding vast caverns, shadowed forests, and meandering rivers. At its heart lies the palace of Rachimabulu, a grand edifice adorned with precious jewels and guarded vigilantly by formidable spirits. Balu comprises diverse realms and domains, each governed by its unique set of laws and populated by varying classes of spirits. These realms range from the serene shores of the Blessed Isles, where virtuous souls find eternal tranquility, to the somber depths of the abyss, where the wicked endure eternal torment. Balu serves as home to a myriad of beings, from benevolent ancestral spirits to malevolent demons, embodying a spectrum of existence. Among the revered inhabitants are the ancestral spirits, believed to oversee and safeguard their living descendants from the confines of Bulu. These spirits receive homage through rituals and offerings, with Fijians seeking their guidance and blessings in times of need. Conversely, Bulu harbors malevolent entities known as Kaluviyu or evil spirits, who revel in chaos and torment. These spirits roam the underworld freely, 
preying on unsuspecting souls and sowing discord wherever they tread. Only Rachamabulu possesses the power to quell these malevolent forces and maintain order within Bulu. At the core of Fijian culture lie rituals and ceremonies intricately woven with themes of death and the afterlife, many of which revolve around the belief in Bulu and its inhabitants. Funeral rites, for instance, play a pivotal role in shepherding the departed souls to Bulu, ensuring their safe transition into the afterlife. These rites encompass elaborate ceremonies, feasts, and offerings, all crafted to honor the departed and appease the spirits of Bulu. Similarly, rituals aimed at communing with ancestral spirits form an integral facet of Fijian religious practice. Offerings of food, drink, and tobacco are frequently employed to invoke their presence and solicit their guidance. Village elders and spiritual leaders often conduct these rituals, serving as intermediaries between the living and the dead, fostering communication and upholding harmony between both realms. While existing predominantly within the realms of myth and legend, Bulu exerts a profound influence on Fijian society, permeating various aspects of culture and tradition. From shaping perceptions of death and mourning to dictating everyday rituals and traditions, belief in Bulu profoundly impacts Fijian societal norms. During times of adversity or uncertainty, Fijians often seek solace and guidance from their ancestors and Rachamabulu, drawing strength from their wisdom and protection. Moreover, the fear of repercussions in the afterlife serves as a potent deterrent against immoral conduct, reinforcing ethical behavior and reverence for tradition within Fijian society. In contemporary times, belief in Bulu continues to evolve, influenced by shifting cultural paradigms such as globalization, urbanization, and the spread of Christianity. While traditional rituals endure as vital components of Fijian religious practice, Newer interpretations of Bulu and its significance emerge, reflecting changing societal dynamics. Some segments of Fijian society, particularly younger generations, question the validity of ancient beliefs amidst the backdrop of scientific rationalism and Western secularism. This skepticism precipitates a gradual decline in traditional religious practices, giving rise to syncretic forms of spirituality. Nonetheless, core tenets of Bulu, such as the afterlife, ancestral reverence, and divine judgment, retain their hold on the collective consciousness of the Fijian people, ensuring Rachamabulu's legacy endures across generations. Avernus. Avernus, the underworld ruled by Pluto, the god of the dead. To comprehend the significance of Avernus in Roman culture, it is essential to first understand the broader context of Roman beliefs regarding the afterlife. Influenced by various religious traditions, including those of the Etruscans and Greeks, the Romans developed a complex cosmology that incorporated ideas of the soul's journey after death, the existence of multiple realms of the afterlife, and the importance of rituals in ensuring a peaceful transition for the deceased. The name Avernus is derived from the Greek word Avernos, meaning birdless, a testament to the eerie and desolate nature of this underworld realm. In Roman mythology, Avernus was believed to be located near Cumi, in present-day Italy, and served as the entrance to the underworld. According to legend, it was here that the hero Aeneas descended into the realm of the dead during his journey to the underworld guided by the Cumean Sibyl. Describing the landscape of Avernus was a task often undertaken by ancient poets and writers, who depicted it as a dark and foreboding realm shrouded in mist and shadow. The entrance to Avernus was marked by a volcanic crater, which was believed to emit poisonous gases, further adding to its ominous reputation. Once inside, the souls of the dead navigated through a series of gloomy caverns and winding rivers, encountering various obstacles and guardians along the way. Pluto, also known as Dispater or Orcus, was the god who presided over Avernus and the underworld as a whole. Often depicted as a stern and implacable figure, Pluto was responsible for judging the souls of the dead and determining their fate in the afterlife. Despite his fearsome reputation, Pluto was also venerated as a thonic deity associated with fertility, wealth, and the cycle of life and death. Within the depths of Avernus, souls were subjected to various forms of punishment or reward based on their deeds in life. 
The virtuous were granted entry into the Elysian Fields, a paradise reserved for heroes and the righteous, while the wicked were condemned to suffer in Tartarus, a realm of eternal torment. Other souls wandered the Asphodel Meadows, a neutral region where they existed in a state of shadowy oblivion. The ancient Romans believed that maintaining a relationship with the spirits of the dead was essential for ensuring prosperity and protection in the earthly realm. As such, they performed elaborate rituals and ceremonies to honor their ancestors and appease the deities of the underworld, offering sacrifices of food, wine, and other valuables to gain their favor. The myth of Avernus has captured the imagination of countless writers, artists, and scholars throughout history inspiring works of literature, poetry, and visual art. From Virgil's Aeneid to Dante's Inferno, Avernus has served as a powerful symbol of the human psyche's darkest fears and desires, reflecting society's evolving understanding of death, morality, and the afterlife. Although the ancient Roman religion has long since faded into history, the legacy of Avernus continues to resonate in modern culture, appearing in literature, film, video games, and other forms of media. Whether as a backdrop for epic quests or as a metaphor for the trials of the human condition, Avernus remains a potent symbol of the enduring fascination with the mysteries of death and the afterlife. Naraka Naraka, the Hindu underworld ruled by Yama, is a realm deeply entrenched in the religious and mythological narratives of Hinduism. It is a place where souls are judged and punished according to their deeds in life reflecting the complex moral and ethical framework of Hindu philosophy. The concept of Naraka finds its roots in ancient Indian scriptures such as the Vedas and the Puranas. In these texts, Naraka is described as the realm of the dead, where souls undergo punishment or purification before being reincarnated. The Rigveda, one of the oldest scriptures of Hinduism, makes references to a dark underworld realm called Put, where the spirits of the deceased dwell. Over time, the concept of Naraka evolved and became more elaborately described in texts like the Mahabharata and the Puranas. These texts outline the intricate workings of Naraka, detailing the various sins and their corresponding punishments meted out to souls after death. Naraka is depicted as a place of torment and suffering, where souls experience the consequences of their actions in life. It is often described as a dark and dismal realm governed by Yama, the god of death and justice. The punishments inflicted in Naraka are tailored to fit the sins committed by the individual during their lifetime. These punishments range from mild to severe, depending on the gravity of the transgressions. The descriptions of Naraka vary across different Hindu texts, but common themes include fire, boiling oil, sharp instruments, and various other forms of torture. Souls may also be subjected to psychological torment, reliving their sins and the pain they cause to others. Naraka is not a monolithic realm but consists of multiple layers or realms, each reserved for souls guilty of specific sins. These realms are meticulously described in texts like the Garuda Purana and the Bhagavata Purana, offering vivid depictions of the torments awaiting sinners. For example, there are realms like Avicii, reserved for those guilty of the most heinous crimes such as betrayal of a guru or killing a Brahmin. In Avicii, souls endure ceaseless agony without respite. Other realms include Rarava, where the tormented souls are surrounded by ferocious beasts and demons, and Tamisra, where darkness shrouds the suffering souls, intensifying their despair. Yama, the god of death, plays a central role in the administration of Naraka. He is depicted as a fearsome deity, wielding a noose with which he captures the souls of the departed and delivers them to their appropriate place in the underworld. However, Yama is not merely a merciless judge, but also a dispenser of justice according to Dharma, the moral law governing the universe. He is often portrayed as impartial and incorruptible, ensuring that each soul receives its due punishment or reward based on its actions. Yama is also revered in Hindu culture as a guide for the departed souls, leading them through the afterlife and helping them navigate the complexities of the spiritual realm. In some traditions, he is worshipped alongside his consort, Yami, who symbolizes the feminine aspect of death and transformation. 
Naraka holds significant theological and philosophical implications within Hindu cosmology. It reflects the Hindu concept of karma, the law of cause and effect, wherein every action has consequences that affect one's future lives. The suffering experienced in Naraka is seen as a necessary purgation for the soul, purifying it of its accumulated negative karma before it can progress towards liberation, moksha. Moreover, Naraka serves as a moral deterrent, reminding individuals of the consequences of their actions and the importance of living a righteous life according to Dharma. The vivid descriptions of hellish torments are intended to instill fear in the hearts of sinners and motivate them towards virtuous conduct. In addition to its moral and ethical dimensions, Naraka also symbolizes the cyclical nature of existence in Hindu cosmology. Souls are believed to undergo repeated cycles of birth, death, and rebirth, samsara, with Naraka serving as one of the intermediate stages in this cosmic journey. Yomi Yomi, the realm of the dead in Shinto mythology, is a place shrouded in mystery and intrigue. Ruled by the goddess Izanami, it is a realm of shadows, spirits, and profound symbolism. To understand Yomi, one must first grasp its mythological origins and its place within the broader framework of Shinto cosmology. At the heart of Yomi's story lies the tale of Izanami and Izanagi, the divine couple credited with creating the Japanese archipelago and its myriad inhabitants. Their union gave birth to the deities who shaped the world, but it also led to tragedy, as Izanami's death in childbirth marked the beginning of her journey into the underworld. Central to the mythology of Yomi is Izanami's descent into the realm of the dead. This chapter explores the haunting imagery of her journey, from the dark waters that separate the worlds of the living and the dead to the ominous gates that mark the entrance to Yomi. Drawing on ancient texts and archaeological evidence, we reconstruct the landscape of Yomi and the trials faced by those who dare to venture into its depths. In Yomi, Izanami reigns supreme as the queen of the underworld, presiding over the realm of the dead with solemn authority. But who is Izanami, and what role does she play in Shinto mythology? This chapter delves into her complex character, exploring her origins, her relationship with Izanagi, and her significance as a symbol of life, death, and the cycle of renewal. Yomi is not just a realm of darkness and despair. It is also a place of transition and transformation, where the souls of the departed await their final journey. In this chapter, we encounter the myriad spirits that populate Yomi, from ancestral guardians to vengeful ghosts. Through ancient myths and modern interpretations, we seek to understand the role of these spirits in Japanese culture and spirituality. Throughout Japanese history, rituals and rites of passage have played a crucial role in navigating the transition from life to death. In this chapter, we explore the various ceremonies associated with death and mourning, from funerary rites to ancestral worship. Through these rituals, we gain insight into the ways in which Japanese society has confronted the mysteries of mortality and honored the spirits of the dead. From ancient scrolls to contemporary manga, the imagery of Yomi has captivated the imaginations of artists and writers for centuries. In this chapter, we survey the rich tapestry of Yomi's portrayal in art and literature, tracing its evolution from ancient mythology to modern pop culture. Through a close analysis of key works, we uncover the ways in which Yomi has been used to explore themes of life, death, and the human condition. Despite the modernization of Japanese society, the beliefs and rituals associated with Yomi continue to hold significance for many people. In this chapter, we examine the role of Yomi in contemporary Shintoism, exploring how traditional practices have adapted to meet the needs of a changing world. Through interviews with priests and practitioners, we gain insight into the enduring appeal of Yomi as a symbol of spiritual renewal and transcendence. Irkala Irkala stands as a realm shrouded in mystery and dread. It is the underworld, the abode of the dead, governed by the enigmatic and formidable goddess Ereshkigal. The Mesopotamian conception of the afterlife was shaped by a rich tapestry of myths and legends that portrayed Irkala as a dark and mysterious realm governed by the goddess Ereshkigal. In this section, we delve into the mythological origins of Irkala, 
tracing its development from the Babylonian creation myth to the epic of Inanna's descent into the underworld. The Babylonians, like many ancient civilizations, had a creation myth that explained the origins of the universe and the gods. According to this myth, the world was created out of chaos by the god Marduk, who defeated the primordial sea goddess Tiamat and used her body to fashion the earth and sky. Among the gods who emerged from this cosmic battle was Ereshkigal, the sister of Inanna, who would later become the ruler of Urkala. Ereshkigal was a complex and enigmatic figure in Mesopotamian mythology, often depicted as a fearsome and vengeful goddess who presided over the realm of the dead. Unlike her sister Inanna, who embodied beauty and fertility, Ereshkigal represented the harsh realities of mortality and decay. She was frequently depicted as a robed figure sitting on a throne, surrounded by demons and monsters. One of the most famous myths involving Urkala is the epic of Inanna's descent into the underworld. In this myth, the goddess Inanna decides to visit the realm of her sister Ereshkigal, seeking to challenge her authority and gain knowledge of the underworld. However, to reach Urkala, Inanna must pass through seven gates, each guarded by a fearsome gatekeeper who demands a toll. Despite the warnings of her loyal servant, Inanna continues her journey, shedding her garments and symbols of power at each gate until she stands naked and vulnerable before her sister. Urkala was conceived as a vast and labyrinthine realm, with its geography and structure governed by strict rules and symbolism. In this section, we explore the architecture of Urkala, including its seven gates, the river of Urkala, and the palace of Ereshkigal. According to Mesopotamian mythology, Urkala was surrounded by seven gates, each of which represented a different stage of the journey into the underworld. These gates were guarded by fearsome demons and monsters who demanded a toll from any mortal seeking to enter. The journey through the seven gates was fraught with peril, as each gatekeeper tested the traveler's resolve and purity. At the heart of Urkala flowed the river of Urkala, also known as Acheron, a dark and turbulent river that separated the realm of the living from the realm of the dead. According to myth, the souls of the dead were ferried across the river by the boatman Urshanabi, who guided them to the palace of Ereshkigal. The river was said to be infested with monstrous creatures and demons, making the journey perilous for the unwary. At the center of Urkala stood the palace of Ereshkigal, a sprawling and forbidding structure that served as the seat of her power. The palace was said to be surrounded by high walls and guarded by legions of demons and monsters who enforced the will of the goddess. Within its shadowy halls, Ereshkigal held court over the souls of the dead, dispensing judgment and punishment according to her whims. Ereshkigal was revered as the queen of the underworld, a powerful and enigmatic figure who held sway over the souls of the dead. In this section, we explore Ereshkigal's role and attributes, as well as her consorts and attendants. Ereshkigal was often depicted as a fearsome and vengeful goddess who ruled over Urkala with an iron fist. Unlike other deities who embodied beauty and fertility, Ereshkigal represented the harsh realities of mortality and decay. She was frequently associated with death, disease, and the cycle of life and death. Despite her fearsome reputation, Ereshkigal was also seen as a compassionate figure who comforted and cared for the souls of the dead. Like many ancient goddesses, Ereshkigal had a retinue of consorts and attendants who served her in the underworld. Among these were the demons Namturu and Nurgle, who acted as her enforcers and messengers. Other lesser deities and spirits were also said to dwell in Urkala, serving Ereshkigal in various capacities. Urkala was said to be populated by a diverse array of beings, including the spirits of the dead, the judges of the underworld, and various demons and monsters. In this section, we explore the inhabitants of Urkala and their roles in Mesopotamian mythology. The primary inhabitants of Urkala were the Gidim, the spirits of the dead who had passed through the seven gates of the underworld. These souls were said to retain their memories and identities in death, existing in a shadowy and insubstantial state. Despite their lack of physical form, the Gidim were believed to be capable of experiencing emotions and sensations, making them similar to the living in many respects. In Mesopotamian mythology, 
The Anunnaki were a group of deities who served as judges and administrators in the underworld. These beings were responsible for maintaining order and enforcing the laws of Ereshkigal, ensuring that the souls of the dead received their due punishment or reward. Among the most important of the Anunnaki were the gatekeepers who guarded the seven gates of Irkala, as well as the demon judges who presided over the judgment of the dead. Irkala was also said to be inhabited by a variety of demons and monsters who served Ereshkigal in various capacities. These creatures were often depicted as fearsome and grotesque beings with twisted forms and malevolent intentions. Among the most famous of these monsters were the Gala, demonic spirits who roamed the underworld in search of victims to drag back to Ereshkigal's palace. Death was an inevitable part of life in ancient Mesopotamia, and the Mesopotamians developed elaborate rituals and funerary practices to ensure a smooth transition for the deceased into the afterlife. In this section, we explore the various rituals and beliefs surrounding death and the afterlife in Mesopotamian culture. The Mesopotamians believed that death was not the end of existence, but rather a transition to a different state of being. As such, they treated the dead with great reverence and respect, performing elaborate rituals to ensure their safe passage to the afterlife. These rituals typically involve the washing and anointing of the body, the provision of funerary offerings, and the recitation of prayers and incantations to guide the soul on its journey. Funerary offerings played a crucial role in Mesopotamian burial practices, as they were believed to provide sustenance and comfort to the deceased in the afterlife. These offerings could include food, drink, clothing, and other items that the deceased would need in their journey to Urkala. In some cases, entire households were buried with their possessions ensuring that the deceased would have everything they needed for eternity. Mourning and grieving were important aspects of Mesopotamian culture, as they allowed the living to express their sorrow and honor the memory of the dead. Funerary rites typically involved a period of mourning during which the family and friends of the deceased would gather to mourn their loss and pay their respects. These rituals could include lamentations, funeral processions, and the performance of sacred rites to ensure the safe passage of the soul to the afterlife. Navigating Urkala The journey of the soul for the ancient Mesopotamians, death was not the end but rather the beginning of a journey to the underworld realm of Urkala. In this section, we explore the Mesopotamian conception of the afterlife and the fate of the soul in Urkala. The Mesopotamians believed that the afterlife was a shadowy and insubstantial realm where the souls of the dead existed in a state of perpetual twilight. Unlike the bright and vibrant world of the living, Irkala was a dark and forbidding place where the spirits of the dead wandered aimlessly for eternity. Despite its gloomy reputation, Irkala was not a place of eternal torment, but rather a continuation of life in a different form. Upon entering Urkala, the souls of the dead were said to undergo a process of judgment in which their deeds and actions in life were weighed against a set of divine laws and standards. Those who had lived righteous and virtuous lives were rewarded with eternal bliss and happiness, while those who had committed evil deeds were punished with eternal torment and suffering. The judgment of the dead was presided over by the Anunnaki, who acted as impartial judges and arbiters of divine justice. Once the judgment of the dead was complete, the souls of the righteous were allowed to dwell in the fields of paradise, where they could enjoy the company of their loved ones and live in peace for eternity. However, the souls of the wicked were condemned to wander the dark and desolate plains of Urkala, where they would suffer for their sins and transgressions. Despite their punishment, these souls were not completely abandoned by the gods, as they were believed to receive occasional visits from their living relatives who brought offerings and prayers on their behalf. The imagery and symbolism associated with Urkala were rich and diverse, reflecting the complex beliefs and attitudes of the ancient Mesopotamians towards death and the afterlife. In this section, we explore the various symbols and motifs associated with Urkala, including the tree of Urkala, the owl, and the Anzu bird. The tree of Irkala was a central symbol in Mesopotamian mythology, representing the cycle of life and death and the interconnectedness of the physical and spiritual worlds. According to myth, the tree of Irkala grew at the center of the underworld, 
its roots reaching deep into the earth and its branches stretching up to the heavens. The tree was said to bear fruit that granted immortality to those who consumed it, symbolizing the eternal cycle of life and death. The owl was another important symbol in Mesopotamian mythology, often associated with death, wisdom, and the afterlife. In Urkala, the owl was believed to be a guardian spirit who watched over the souls of the dead and guided them on their journey through the underworld. Its nocturnal habits and eerie call made it a fitting symbol of the darkness and mystery of Urkala, as well as the wisdom and knowledge that could be gained from the experience of death. The Anzu bird was a mythical creature in Mesopotamian mythology, often depicted as a giant eagle or falcon with the body of a lion and the wings of an eagle. In Urkala, the Anzu bird was believed to serve as a symbol of divine authority and power, acting as a messenger and emissary of the gods. Its majestic form and fearsome appearance made it a fitting symbol of the gods' dominion over the underworld and their role in judging the souls of the dead. Irkala was a popular theme in Mesopotamian literature and art, appearing in a variety of texts, poems, and artworks that depicted the underworld realm and its inhabitants. In this section, we explore some of the most famous depictions of Irkala in ancient Mesopotamian culture and its enduring influence on subsequent religious and cultural traditions. The Mesopotamians left behind a rich corpus of literature that provides detailed descriptions of Urkala and its inhabitants. These texts, including the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Descent of Inanna, and the Epic of Era, offer vivid depictions of the underworld realm and its various landmarks, such as the Seven Gates, the River of Urkala, and the Palace of Ereshkigal. Through these texts, we gain insight into the Mesopotamian conception of the afterlife and the role of Irkala in their religious beliefs. In addition to literary sources, Irkala was also a popular subject in Mesopotamian art and iconography, appearing in a variety of sculptures, reliefs, and seals that depicted scenes from the underworld realm. These artworks often depicted Ereshkigal seated on her throne, surrounded by demons and monsters, or showed the souls of the dead being ferried across the river of Urkala by the boatman Urshanabi. Through these visual representations, we gain further insight into the Mesopotamian conception of Urkala and its significance in their religious and cultural worldview. Although Mesopotamian civilization eventually declined and was supplanted by other cultures, the legacy of Urkala continued to exert influence on subsequent religious and cultural traditions. Elements of Mesopotamian mythology, including the concept of the underworld and the judgment of the dead, can be found in various religious traditions, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Likewise, the imagery and symbolism associated with Irkala have inspired artists, writers, and filmmakers throughout history, who have drawn upon its rich mythology to create works of art and literature that continue to captivate and inspire audiences to this day. Hades. This realm, known simply as Hades, serves as the final destination for mortal souls after death, a place shrouded in mystery and surrounded by myths. The genesis of Hades and the underworld lies within the intricate tapestry of Greek mythology, a narrative rich with the primordial chaos from which the universe emerged. Among the Titans, the ancient deities who ruled the cosmos, Cronus and his consort Rhea birthed three powerful gods, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. As the youngest of these divine siblings, Hades inherited dominion over the vast and mysterious realm known as the Underworld. This domain, more than a mere geographical location, represents a complex underworld with its own unique geography, inhabitants, and governing principles. At its core lies Tartarus, a realm designated for the punitive torment of the most depraved souls, while the Elysian fields offer respite and reward for the virtuous. Hades, often shrouded in mystery and misunderstood, emerges as a figure distinct from his more visible brethren, Zeus and Poseidon. Unlike them, Hades rarely interceded in the affairs of mortals, preferring to maintain a detached sovereignty over the souls of the departed. Depicted in art and literature as a somber figure, Hades wields symbols of his authority, such as a scepter or helm, signifying his dominion over the underworld. Despite his ominous reputation, 
Hades embodies not malevolence but rather the natural cycle of life and death, an essential component for the cosmic equilibrium. Embedded within the annals of Greek mythology are enduring tales of heroic odysseys to the underworld. Whether it be Orpheus's descent to retrieve his beloved Eurydice or Heracles' laborious capture of Cerberus, these narratives offer glimpses into the realm of Hades and its diverse inhabitants. Central to these myths is the River Styx, acting as the demarcation between the realms of the living and the dead. Sharon, the ferryman, guides departed souls across this boundary, demanding payment for passage. Those unable to meet his toll are consigned to eternal limbo along the Styx's shores. The underworld teems with a myriad of beings, ranging from judges of the dead like Minos, Radamanthus, and Aeacus to the fearsome guardians such as Cerberus, the three-headed hound. Among its most renowned inhabitants are the Shades, spectral remnants of mortal souls consigned to an existence devoid of earthly joys and sorrows. Throughout ancient Greece, ceremonies and cults venerating Hades held pivotal roles in religious observance. While not as ubiquitous as his siblings Zeus and Poseidon, Hades garnered reverence at various sanctuaries, including Eleusis and Hermione. These rituals, often featuring offerings of food and libations, particularly those associated with the deceased, sought to placate the god and ensure a tranquil transition for departed souls into the afterlife. The underworld's resonance extends beyond mythological narratives, permeating the realms of literature and philosophy. From Homer's Odyssey to Plato's Republic, the underworld symbolizes the existential darkness and trials inherent to the human condition. In Plato's Phaedo, for instance, Socrates ponders death and the soul's immortality, positing that death merely signifies the separation of soul from body. This concept, rooted in Greek beliefs about the afterlife, profoundly shapes perspectives on mortality and transcendence. Even in modernity, Hades and his realm persist as enduring motifs in art, literature, and popular media. From T.S. Eliot's evocative poetry to J.R.R. Tolkien's epic fantasy, the themes of mortality and redemption inherent in Greek mythology continue to captivate audiences. In contemporary culture, reinterpretations of Hades manifest in diverse forms, from Disney's portrayal in Hercules to video games like Hades by Supergiant Games. These adaptations imbue ancient myths with fresh relevance, ensuring their enduring resonance in an ever-evolving cultural landscape. Tamak, in the vast expanse of the Mongolian steppes lies a realm hidden from mortal eyes, a realm teeming with darkness and mystery. This is Tamuk, the underworld of Mongolian folklore, where souls journey after death and where the ancient deity Erlik reigns supreme. Delving into the depths of Tamuk is akin to embarking on a journey into the heart of Mongolian mythology, where legends intertwine with spiritual beliefs shaping the cultural landscape of the nomadic people of Mongolia. To understand Tamuk, one must delve into the depths of Mongolian mythology and cosmology. Central to Mongolian beliefs is the concept of the three realms, the upper world, the middle world, the realm of mortals, and the underworld. Tamuk exists as the netherworld, a realm below the surface of the earth where spirits and souls reside after death. Its origins are deeply intertwined with the creation myth of Mongolian folklore, where the god Tengri, the supreme sky deity, crafted the world and all its inhabitants. According to legend, Tengri tasked Erlik, his second-born son, with shaping the underworld, granting him dominion over Tamag. However, Erlik harbored envy and resentment towards his brother Uljan, the creator of the middle and upper worlds. This jealousy would shape the nature of Tamag, infusing it with darkness and chaos. The geography of Tamag is described in various folk tales and epic poems, depicting it as a vast subterranean realm filled with caverns, rivers of molten lava, and desolate landscapes. Its boundaries are said to be guarded by fierce guardians, preventing the living from venturing into its depths. Tamag is populated by a myriad of beings, ranging from the souls of the deceased to malevolent spirits and demons. Upon death, the souls of the departed are said to embark on a perilous journey through the underworld, 
facing trials and tribulations along the way. These souls are guided by psychopomps, spiritual entities that assist them in navigating the treacherous terrain of Tamag. One of the most prominent inhabitants of Tamag is Ehrlich himself, the lord of the underworld and the primary antagonist in Mongolian mythology. Ehrlich is depicted as a malevolent deity, often associated with death, disease, and misfortune. His realm reflects his dark and twisted nature, with caverns shrouded in eternal darkness and rivers of blackened waters. Aside from Ehrlich, Tamag is home to a plethora of spirits and demons, each embodying different aspects of the human condition. There are spirits of vengeance, who roam the underworld seeking retribution against those who wrong them in life. There are also benevolent spirits, who offer guidance and protection to the souls of the deceased. The journey through Tamag is a central theme in Mongolian folklore, symbolizing the passage from life to death and the transition between the mortal realm and the afterlife. Tales of heroes and shamans venturing into the underworld abound in Mongolian mythology, each narrative exploring the themes of courage, redemption, and mortality. One of the most famous stories is that of Geser Khan, a legendary hero who embarks on a quest to rescue his wife from the clutches of Ehrlich. Guided by the spirits of the underworld, Geser Khan traverses the treacherous landscapes of Tamag, facing formidable challenges along the way. His journey is fraught with peril, as he battles demons and overcomes obstacles in his quest to defeat Ehrlich and free his beloved. Another tale tells of the shamanic journey, where shamans enter into trance-like states to commune with the spirits of the underworld. Through ritualistic practices such as drumming and chanting, shamans navigate the realms of Tamag, seeking guidance and wisdom from the spirits that dwell within. The inhabitants of Mongolia have a deep reverence for the spirits of Tamag, believing that they hold sway over the affairs of the living. To appease these spirits and ensure their favor, the Mongolian people perform various rituals and offerings throughout the year. One such ritual is the Tsam ceremony, a colorful and elaborate spectacle that takes place during religious festivals. In the Tsam, masked dancers reenact scenes from Mongolian mythology portraying the battles between gods and demons and invoking the spirits of the underworld. Offerings are also made to the spirits of Tamag, usually in the form of food, drink, and incense. These offerings are placed at sacred sites such as mountains, rivers, and caves, where it is believed the spirits reside. By making offerings, the Mongolian people seek to establish a connection with the inhabitants of Tamag, seeking their protection and blessings. Ehrlich holds a prominent place in Mongolian mythology, revered as both a deity and a figure of fear. Despite his malevolent nature, Ehrlich is worshipped by some as a powerful patron deity, particularly among those who practice shamanism. The cult of Ehrlich is shrouded in secrecy, with rituals and ceremonies conducted in hidden places far from prying eyes. Followers of Ehrlich believe that by appeasing the lord of the underworld, they can gain his favor and protection in this life and the next. However, the cult of Ehrlich is not without controversy, as some view it as a dangerous and heretical practice. Ehrlich's association with death and darkness has led many to fear and revile him, viewing his worshippers as agents of malevolence and chaos. Tamag is the setting for a rich tapestry of legends and folklore, passed down through generations by Mongolian storytellers. These stories range from epic sagas of heroism and valor to cautionary tales of the dangers that lurk in the underworld. One such legend is that of the Nine White Old Men, ancient beings who dwell in the depths of Tamag and hold sway over the fates of mortals. According to legend, these enigmatic figures possess vast knowledge and wisdom, but they are also capricious and unpredictable, often bestowing blessings or curses upon those who encounter them. Another popular tale is that of the Black River, a mystical waterway that flows through the heart of Tamag. It is said that those who drink from its waters will be granted eternal life, but at a terrible cost. Many adventurers have sought out the Black River, drawn by the promise of immortality, only to meet a tragic fate at the hands of the river's guardians. The mythology of Tamag has had a profound influence on the culture and society of Mongolia, shaping its religious beliefs, artistic traditions, and cultural identity. 
Tamag is not merely a realm of the imagination. It is a living, breathing part of Mongolian life, woven into the fabric of its collective consciousness. One of the most visible manifestations of Tamag's influence is in Mongolian art and literature. Countless paintings, sculptures, and poems depict scenes from the underworld, capturing the dark and mysterious essence of Tamag for future generations to behold. Tamag has also left its mark on Mongolian religious practices, with rituals and ceremonies dedicated to appeasing the spirits of the underworld. Shamanism, in particular, continues to thrive in Mongolia, with shamans serving as intermediaries between the living and the dead, communing with the spirits of Tamug on behalf of their communities. In recent years, there has been a resurgence of interest in Mongolian mythology, fueled by a growing sense of cultural pride and identity. Scholars and artists alike have sought to explore the depths of Tamug, reinterpreting its myths and legends for a contemporary audience. Modern interpretations of Tamag often draw parallels with other mythological traditions, exploring themes of death, rebirth, and the afterlife from a global perspective. Through novels, films, and other forms of media, Tamag has found new life in the modern world, captivating audiences with its timeless tales of heroism and adventure. In the rich tapestry of ancient Egyptian mythology, the concept of the afterlife held profound significance. At the heart of this belief system lay Aru, the realm of bliss ruled by Osiris. This expansive underworld was envisioned as a paradise where the souls of the deceased could enjoy eternal happiness and fulfillment. To comprehend the significance of Aru, it is essential to understand the broader framework of the afterlife in ancient Egyptian belief systems. Central to Egyptian cosmology was the idea of continuity, where existence transcended the physical realm into the spiritual and beyond. Death was not viewed as the end, but rather as a transition to another state of being, where the soul embarked on a journey through various realms, ultimately seeking eternal union with the divine. The ancient Egyptians believed that each individual possessed a ka, a spiritual double, and a ba, a soul that could move freely between the earthly realm and the afterlife. To ensure a successful transition to the afterlife, elaborate funerary rituals and ceremonies were conducted, including the mummification process and the burial of grave goods to accompany the deceased on their journey. These practices were essential to provide sustenance and comfort to the soul in the afterlife. At the heart of Egyptian mythology stood Osiris, the god of the afterlife, rebirth, and the underworld. Osiris was revered as the benevolent ruler of Aru, embodying the ideals of kingship, fertility, and renewal. His mythological narrative, as recounted in ancient Egyptian texts such as the Pyramid Texts and the Coffin Texts, serves as a foundational framework for understanding the significance of Aru in the context of the afterlife. According to mythological accounts, Osiris was born to the earth god Geb and the sky goddess Nut, along with his siblings Isis, Seth, and Nephthys. Osiris ascended to the throne of Egypt, bringing civilization and prosperity to the land through his wisdom and benevolence. However, his brother Seth, consumed by jealousy and ambition, plotted against him, leading to a tragic series of events that culminated in Osiris's death and dismemberment. Isis, Osiris's devoted wife and sister, embarked on a quest to resurrect him and restore order to the cosmos. Through her magical prowess and unwavering love, Isis reassembled Osiris's body and revived him, albeit temporarily. Osiris, now transformed into the lord of the underworld, became the eternal ruler of Aru, where he presided over the souls of the deceased and ensured their well-being in the afterlife. Aru, often depicted as a lush and fertile paradise, represented the ultimate destination for the souls of the righteous and virtuous in ancient Egyptian belief. This idyllic realm, also known as the Field of Reeds or the Elysian Fields, offered a vision of eternal happiness, abundance, and tranquility for those deemed worthy of entry. Let us delve deeper into the various aspects of Aru, from its geography to the rewards it offered to the souls of the deceased. The journey to Aru was fraught with challenges and obstacles, 
requiring the deceased to navigate through the treacherous realms of the underworld while undergoing judgment and scrutiny by divine beings. Upon death, the soul embarked on a perilous voyage through the Duet, the realm of the dead, guided by funerary texts such as the Book of the Dead and the Book of Gates. These texts contain spells, prayers, and instructions to aid the deceased in their journey and ensure safe passage to Aru. The soul encountered various guardians and gatekeepers along the way, including the monstrous serpent Apep, who sought to devour the sun god Are and plunge the world into darkness. Through the recitation of magical spells and the performance of ritualistic actions, the deceased sought to overcome these obstacles and reach the celestial realms of Aru, where Osiris awaited them as the ultimate arbiter of judgment. Aru was envisioned as a verdant oasis nestled within the celestial realm, characterized by fertile fields, flowing rivers, and abundant vegetation. The landscape of Aru mirrored the fertile floodplains of the Nile River, symbolizing the cyclical patterns of life, death, and regeneration that governed Egyptian cosmology. In contrast to the harsh and barren landscapes of the Duet, Aru represented a paradisiacal sanctuary where the souls of the deceased could enjoy eternal peace and prosperity. Central to the imagery of Aru were the fields of offerings, vast expanses of agricultural land irrigated by the waters of the celestial Nile. Here, the blessed dead engaged in agricultural pursuits, cultivating crops and tending to livestock in abundance. The bounty of Aru provided sustenance and nourishment to the souls, ensuring their eternal vitality and well-being in the afterlife. The souls who successfully reached Aru were rewarded with eternal bliss and rejuvenation, free from the toils and tribulations of mortal existence. In Aru, the deceased were reunited with their loved ones and ancestors, forming eternal bonds of fellowship and camaraderie. The realm of Osiris offered respite from the burdens of earthly life, granting the souls an opportunity to bask in the divine radiance of the gods and goddesses who dwelled therein. One of the most cherished rewards of Aru was the prospect of eternal life and rejuvenation. The blessed dead were depicted as youthful and vigorous, free from the ravages of age and infirmity that afflicted mortals. The rejuvenating waters of the celestial Nile imbued the souls with vitality and vigor, ensuring their perpetual health and vitality for all eternity. The daily life of the blessed dead in Aru revolved around harmonious coexistence with nature and the divine. The souls engaged in agricultural activities, tending to fields of wheat, barley, and other crops that flourished in the fertile soil of the celestial realm. The bounty of Aru sustained the souls, providing them with nourishment and sustenance for their eternal existence. Beyond agricultural pursuits, the souls of Aru also participated in various recreational and leisure activities. Scenes depicted in ancient Egyptian funerary art often portray the blessed dead engaged in music, dance, and feasting, celebrating the joys of communal fellowship and camaraderie. These activities serve to reinforce the sense of harmony and unity that permeated life in Aru, fostering a collective sense of belonging and fulfillment among its inhabitants. The belief in Aru played a central role in Egyptian funerary practices and rituals, shaping the manner in which the deceased were prepared for their journey to the afterlife. The elaborate funerary rites conducted by ancient Egyptians were intended to ensure the safe passage of the soul to Aru and facilitate its integration into the celestial realm. These rituals encompassed a wide range of activities, including mummification, burial ceremonies, and the provision of grave goods and offerings. Mummification, in particular, held profound significance in Egyptian funerary practices as it was believed to preserve the physical body and facilitate the soul's journey to the afterlife. The process of mummification involved the removal of internal organs, the application of natron salts to desiccate the body, and the wrapping of the corpse in linen bandages adorned with protective amulets and spells. The mummified remains were then placed in ornate coffins and interred in tombs, along with provisions and offerings to sustain the deceased in the afterlife. The imagery of Aru is pervasive in ancient Egyptian texts, art, and religious iconography, reflecting its central importance in Egyptian religious belief and cosmology. Texts such as the Pyramid Texts, 
the coffin texts, and the Book of the Dead contain vivid descriptions of Aru and its inhabitants, detailing the rewards and challenges that awaited the souls in the afterlife. These texts served as spiritual guidebooks for the deceased, providing them with the knowledge and wisdom necessary to navigate the perilous journey through the underworld and attain eternal salvation in Aru. In addition to textual sources, Aru is also depicted extensively in ancient Egyptian art and iconography, including tomb paintings, funerary stele, and temple reliefs. These artistic representations offer glimpses into the idyllic landscapes of Aru, populated by lush vegetation, flowing rivers, and abundant wildlife. Scenes of the blessed dead engaged in agricultural activities, feasting, and leisure pursuits adorn the walls of tombs and temples, providing insights into the daily life and culture of Aru's inhabitants. The concept of Aru continues to resonate in contemporary culture, inspiring artists, writers, and scholars to explore its themes of death, rebirth, and transcendence. In literature and film, references to the Egyptian afterlife and the realm of Osiris abound, serving as a source of fascination and intrigue for audiences around the world. From the mystical landscapes of Aru to the enigmatic figure of Osiris, these elements continue to captivate the imagination and spark creative expression in diverse artistic mediums. In popular culture, Aru has been depicted in various forms, ranging from historical dramas to fantasy novels and video games. Writers and filmmakers often draw upon the imagery and symbolism of ancient Egypt to craft narratives that explore themes of mortality, spirituality, and the quest for immortality. Through these creative interpretations, the legacy of Aru lives on, transcending the boundaries of time and culture to inspire new generations of storytellers and seekers. In the rich tapestry of religious narratives across the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, one enigmatic realm stands out with its eternal flames and tormented souls. Hell, revered as the domain of punishment and despair, hell is shrouded in mystery and fear, serving as a cautionary tale against moral transgressions. At its helm stand two infamous figures, Lucifer and Satan, the fallen angels whose rebellion against the divine order condemned them to rule over this abyss. Origins of Hell to comprehend the essence of hell, we must delve into its origins as depicted in the sacred scriptures of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In these narratives, hell emerges as a consequence of divine justice, a realm designed to punish the wicked and uphold the sanctity of moral law. Its foundations trace back to the rebellion of Lucifer, the once glorious archangel who coveted divine power and autonomy. Alongside his cohorts, Lucifer, renamed Satan after his fall, waged war against the heavenly host, leading to his ultimate defeat and expulsion from the celestial realms. Cast down into the depths of hell, Satan assumed dominion over this infernal domain, where he reigns as the tormentor-in-chief, eternally opposed to the divine will. The nature of hell. Hell is envisioned as a realm of unrelenting torment and suffering, characterized by eternal flames, gnashing of teeth, and unquenchable thirst. Its landscapes are desolate and inhospitable, devoid of light and warmth, where the damned are subjected to ceaseless punishment for their transgressions. The infernal architecture of hell is described in vivid detail across religious texts, featuring cavernous pits, fiery lakes, and labyrinthine dungeons where sinners endure the wrath of divine justice. Time in hell is perceived as an unending continuum, devoid of respite or redemption, where each moment stretches into eternity amidst the agonizing cries of the damned. Inhabitants of Hell The denizens of hell comprise a diverse array of souls deemed unworthy of salvation, condemned to endure the full extent of divine retribution. Among them are the unrepentant sinners, whose earthly deeds have earned them a one-way ticket to damnation as well as the fallen angels who followed Lucifer in his rebellion against God. Across religious traditions, hell is populated by an assortment of malevolent entities, from demons and specters to monstrous creatures embodying the darkest depths of human depravity. Each soul in hell bears the weight of its sins, destined to suffer in accordance with the severity of its transgressions, 
with no hope of reprieve or redemption. The role of Lucifer and Satan. At the heart of hell's governance stand two central figures whose names evoke fear and revulsion, Lucifer and Satan. In Christian theology, Lucifer is often depicted as the archetypal rebel, whose pride and ambition led to his downfall and subsequent transformation into Satan, the embodiment of evil and temptation. As the ruler of hell, Satan embodies defiance against divine authority, orchestrating the torment of the damned with diabolical fervor. His domain extends across the infernal landscape, where he presides over legions of demons and fallen angels, perpetuating a reign of terror that knows no bounds. Cosmic Forces and Divine Justice Beyond its earthly manifestations, hell is imbued with profound metaphysical significance, serving as a testament to the eternal struggle between good and evil within the cosmic order. In the Abrahamic traditions, hell is but one facet of the divine plan, a necessary counterpart to the promise of salvation and redemption offered to the righteous. Its existence underscores the moral imperative of human free will and the consequences of moral agency, wherein the choices made in life reverberate throughout eternity. Within the theological framework of divine justice, hell represents the ultimate expression of cosmic retribution, ensuring that evil is met with commensurate punishment and the integrity of divine law remains inviolate.